Hello, working preachers. Rolf Jacobson here to let you know that today is the first day of our spring fundraising campaign. When you make a gift during the campaign before May 31st, your gift will go twice as far and be doubled. Working Preacher would not be possible without generous donors like you. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. You can make your gift online at workingpreacher.org. And as a special thank you at the end of this campaign, all Working Preacher donors will receive a free gift, a set of recordings from the 2021 Festival of Homiletics by Caroline, Matt, Joy, and myself. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Ralph Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And again this week, uh, just note that we are missing our colleague and friend, Joy Moore. She is the academic dean and vice president, which means she has important <clears throat> meetings that uh, interfere with her study of the Bible. No, just kidding. She's just, uh, <laughs> she wishes she could be here, but uh, is forced by the uh, duties of her vocation not to be here today. We look forward to see, uh, uh, welcoming her back soon. So th this is the podcast for May 9th, uh, 2021, the sixth Sunday of Easter. The first reading is Acts 10, 44 through 48. The Psalm is 98. The epistle is 1 John 5, 1 through 6. And the gospel reading is from John chapter 15, 9 through 7 and continuing in the farewell discourse and more talk about abiding, which if you didn't know is the word meno, Caroline, in Greek. Thank you for that reminder. Yes, meno, <clears throat> very important. We are continuing in this, uh, in the farewell discourse and with the image we had last week of the vine, we talked about last week uh, how the uh, this this image or this metaphor is is located in the farewell discourse to uh, to uh, as a as a metaphor of comfort and as a metaphor of promise uh, as Jesus is is leaving the disciples. Uh, a couple of uh, things that I I want to call attention to that uh, introduction of language here that you can carry forward or move forward in the gospel that foreshadows. Uh, really important uh, themes in this in this gospel that you can then bring back into your preaching of this passage. Uh, the first is, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you. And this uh, language of joy is going to get uh, picked up again in chapter 16, particularly uh, chapter 16, 20, 21, 22, 24, and then get again, 17, 13. I've always been really struck by this language of joy uh, in the midst of a deeply sorrowful and uh, troubling uh, passage or section of the gospel. And it, and it really is a foreshadowing of, uh, of 2020, where the disciples see Jesus and they, re and they rejoice. And a foreshadowing of the, the, the joy here is that this relationship will never be severed, that I will never abandon you, that I am preparing a place for you. But the, uh, but it, the, but the joy is, is juxtaposed with that trouble and with that sorrow and with the reality of still being in the world. It doesn't replace it and it doesn't, uh, it's, it's not going to take away the reality of, of still being in the world and, and, and what the disciples are going to experience between now and that resurrection. And I think there's something really, uh, how much that describes the human condition and how much that speaks into our lives of, of holding, um, holding simultaneously uh, the, the, the sorrow of the sorrow of, of separation and yet, uh, yet, yet the realities of joy that we have experienced. I was, uh, I'm, I've been, uh, meeting with one of our, uh, uh parishioners in our church about, uh, she's in hospice and, uh, she wants me to do her, uh, her, funeral um, sermon, if you will. And that's, uh, and that's what we've been talking about. She, she is one that is holding a kind of joy in this space of impending death that I have, I don't know that I've ever experienced. Uh, and recognizing that, uh, that 
the way in which her spirit <laughs> and the way in which the kind of impact she has had is going to uh, is going to keep on is going to abide. So uh, maybe that could be a homiletical place to explore of that reality of our lives that Jesus is that Jesus is speaking into. It's really powerful. I don't think I'd ever really noticed the the presence of joy in John in these places, right? You always ask me about if you ask me about joy, I would always run to Philippians or something like that, which um, in some ways is different, but also in some ways similar. There, Paul's imagining his own death, but the idea of facing imminent death with joy, or just even facing human finitude with joy, is really powerful. <clears throat> um, I don't want to take this in too much of a different direction, but is friendship important there as well? I mean, that yeah. the idea of friends and friendship has so much resonance in, in Greek philosophy. I don't know if John expects first century readers to hear that, or if there are Old Testament connections to friendship that might be important. Is it, does it have a sense of equals here, or well, is it a sense of special inner circle? Or I mean, what is... Well, I think it's, uh, I would point our listeners, our preachers out there to an article by my doctor mother, Gail O'Day, uh, which is, if you just Google friendship um, in the Gospel of John, she has a, a, a really helpful article about friendship as a category uh, for, uh, for community and for understanding the life of faith that uh, and and that this would be, you're right, Matt, this is a completely different direction, but the way in which we cast friendship now is not the way first century, the first century realities of friendship as, as, a, as, a, as a kind of equal or contractual reality. Uh, and there's certain responsibilities of friendship and the way in which the friendship as a social category uh, really uh, not maybe not replaces, but kind of does other social relationships that that, that define community, and so and that and and it's particularly important. I mean, French when Jesus says in fourteen, "You are my friends." I mean, another way to translate that is, "You are my loved ones." I mean, it, it's phileo is to love. It's just. Uh, and so how we, and that same verb is going to be used again in John 21, 15 to 19, where, where Jesus says, you know, uh, if you love me, right, and, and the verbs go back and forth between agapao and phileo. And, uh, and that is for Peter to draw on this passage. This is what I'm talking about. This is what friendship looks like. This is this new sort of category of relationship that invites a, 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 a deeply relational, interrelational, dependent uh, kind of existence. And that's what this love looks like. And it's not, it's not stratified or hierarchical, uh, but, uh, but mutual. And, uh, and how Jesus has described what his ministry is, is how we then go forward in that. Is that Makes sense. That's really helpful. Um, but can't 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 love be both hierarchical and mutual at the same time? That you know that is, uh, you know, as a child lo uh, loves a parent, there's still there's still hierarchy, but there's mutuality. And obviously, Christ as Messiah or Jesus as Messiah, Christ as Messiah sort of is repetitive, isn't it? The um, you know that he's still he is still the teacher, right? He's still. Jesus, um, even as he calls them friends, um, he but he is he is kind of redefining something, isn't he? Because he says, "Now I call you friends." Um, I, I, I just exegetically, just to note uh, that this is a, again a case so that whatever our concept of friendship is, just because you read the word friend then in, in the Bible, that doesn't mean the concepts are the same. And so exegetically, obviously, what you do is you work to say. What would have friendship meant both? How does the Old Testament inform uh, first century Judas, Jewish understandings of friendship? How does Greco-Roman, you know, and, and so you do, you do that kind of thought pattern to try to get at what this means. That's where that article by uh, yeah. Gail O'Day is really, really helpful. Um, you know, and the other, I mean, the, the other sort of uh, aspect about this section that informs that, that, that 
that understanding of what friendship means and what does it mean no greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends in 1512 is basically a restatement of John 13, 34 to 35, the love commandment, uh, which of course we just heard in Monday, Thursday, but that love commandment, um, and I've talked about this, you know, a bajillion times is framed by Judas's betrayal and Peter's denial. And so this, this love one another is, is and, and what does it mean to be friends? Uh, it, uh, it really is imbued with a much greater weight and much greater sort of seriousness uh, and responsibility and accountability when you recognize that Jesus is making this, making this you know, reminding them of this commandment. And now what does that mean for them going forward? What's next? Well, Hello, podcast. Yeah. Sure. If last week we had the, the, the conversion of a very unlikely character in the Ethiopian court official, in many ways this week we've got not so much an unlikely person because this is, you know, obviously the end of the Cornelius story. Cornelius was already a... a uh, somebody who feared God, somebody who, whose life appeared to have a lot of space in it for the God of Israel. But what's astounding here is the gift of the Spirit, which I think is why we just get these five verses. The, the idea that the Spirit comes, that the Spirit precedes baptism, that the Spirit's presence is so palpable that Peter can say, we're done here, uh, time to baptize, and I'm going to stay, right? I'm going to receive hospitality now in this place it's the, the cornelius story all of chapter 10 18 verses in chapter 11 is impossible to to take people into and all of its weirdness and and all of the the monumental characteristics of it in a single sermon but here you can at least talk a bit about some of this i mean in some ways you're starting to bend all the way towards pentecost now as well that one of the things that is a consequence of easter is the presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit, but not just for the insiders, not just for the preachers, not just for the public people, but now truly for all. So the universalism of Acts is starting to really bust open here uh, in ways that had been talked about subtly uh, by Jesus at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts, but now we're starting to see it. And this is one of the things, right? This is, uh, I, most people don't realize this, but one of the, the most astounding things, or one of the, maybe I should say the most, like influential things that happens in the early decades of the Christian church is the conviction of some that the Gentiles have fully received the Holy Spirit simply without works, right? But just simply through the hearing of the gospel or their response to it. And therefore, as a result, they're fully in. I mean, just that, that development, I, I think it's fair to say was not foreseen by anybody. Um, the exception of perhaps Jesus, but it's hard to, to drill into exactly what he was thinking of there. You know, that, that this would be it, that Peter didn't say, let's start a confirmation class for you now, or let's, let's, uh, let's change your lifestyle to make it, you know, cohere with what the rest of the church demands. Um, so I don't know how you, how you pull that out of just five verses, but I think you have to, just to show how amazing this story truly is and has consequences for us even today. I, I really dislike just having five verses. Uh, you know, I, it, I, if somebody's been preaching through Acts, obviously you have to tell the longer story here. I mean, you don't have to read it. Uh, probably reading it would be counterproductive, but at least tell the story. And and one of the things that's great about it is um, while Peter was still speaking, mm -hmm. uh, the Holy Spirit got tired of Peter talking, you know? <laughs> Peter, it's like, okay, this sermon has gone on too long. I'm just going to fall on people now. And, uh, and so uh, the Holy Spirit, it, and it doesn't say what it sounded. It doesn't say the Holy, it says this, the Holy Spirit found upon all who hear the word and Peter and the others were astounded. Well, what did it look like when the Holy Spirit fell on them? Did they all jump up and start speaking in tongues? Did they all do dances? Did they get, did visible flames of the spirit? Uh, they do speak light in their, tongues, huh? They do speak in tongues. Yes. Uh, oh God. Oh, I see. That's right. For they were. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Okay. It, it holds that for a minute. Um, 
but it's so great, right? It's uh, the, the spirit interrupts Peter's sermon and then Peter's amazed. And th it really does continue the theme of last week. Last week, um, what is to pre prevent me from being baptized? And here, Peter, can anyone withhold baptism from those who've already received the spirit? It's great. Well, and I, I would also point um, our listeners to the uh, commentary on the website by Jerusha Neal. And I, she really kind of gets at some of that, what you were talking about earlier, Matt, of uh, this, uh, you know, this, the spirit's noisy interruption, uh, as you said, Rolf, of Peter's sermon convicts, uh, convicts our lust for the normal or the way in which are we ready for such rips in the fabric of our expectations. And so that's, 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 the, that's the heart of Acts. And, um, and again, when we talked about last week, the way in which you know how much how much have we domesticized um, the the story of the empty tomb and uh, and and this constant push to say wait a minute what does Easter mean uh, and that we cannot contain Easter as as our promise of salvation or our promise of eternal life or that death even that death doesn't have the final victory there is more to it uh, there really is and so are we willing as a church to uh, to engage in that question, what does Easter mean here and now in this space and time? Uh, I think is I think is the is the question for this passage. You might even, um, if you're preaching this and trying to figure out how do you how do you manage such a, a large story, you might even spend more time in what happens next in chapter eleven. Than trying to rehearse too much of what happens after this, because when Peter goes in Acts chapter eleven, the response isn't, "What were you doing talking to Gentiles?" The response of the church in Jerusalem is, "Why did you go into a Gentile's home and eat with them? Like, why did you transgress this boundary that we thought was pretty clear?" And then when you get to the end of chapter eleven, I'm not saying you have to add all these verses, but to pull people into the 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 scandal of the story. At the end, the response is after Peter retells the story. God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. So it's the God has given. It's the, you know, the spirit is the agent here in the story. It's not the sermon that somehow is brilliant or persuasive. Um, but God has done this and God has done something amazing. And the story is now effectively decided or the question is decided by the presence of the spirit. And what would it be like for, like going back to Ralph, like what would it be like for the spirit to fall on you? You know, like Probably fall scary. upon you. Wow. What would it be like for Peter to get served his first meal in a Gentile's home also? It's another good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. The last verse, they invited him to stay for several days. Uh, and one of the themes that I've been pounding away on for the last several years is to reverse the, reverse the direction of hospitality, that the church's mission should not be primarily framed only as we are hospitable to guests, but that we learn to be guests who rely on the hospitality of others, which means crossing culture out of our cultural boundaries into someone else's and not imposing our, uh, especially, you know, in the, in churches like our, ours, Presbyterian and Lutheran North American communities, not imposing our sort of European um, cultural norms on those who, you know, would become Presbyterian or Lutheran, but actually going outside and learning, uh, eating other people's foods, listening to their music, uh, smelling their smells, being in their homes. Um, I think uh, the it's clear what Jesus, it's kind of interesting because in Acts, you know, which is, I don't know if you knew this, Matt, it's the first volume of this, uh, this work. Uh, Jesus has already sent out in Acts 10, the disciples to do exactly this go and stay in the houses and eat whatever is put before you. So it's kind of, it's, but now this is, right, this kicks it up to, or it turns the volume up to 11 on that. Now you're going into Romans houses. All right. Again, the Psalm, psalm is, 98. yeah, the Psalm is an, a response to Acts. And so it's, uh, you know, it's a um, so-called enthronement Psalm. There's two ways of, of classifying Psalms, either by form uh, or by content. When you call this an enthronement psalm, you're now classifying it by content, not by form. So it's uh, it's a little slippery in that way. Uh, 
it's like you put lemon pepper in your spices under pepper because it's not pepper. It's really salt. Or do you put it with the salt? You know what I'm saying? Uh, no, you don't. But uh, pepper it's has obviously salt in it? lemon pepper. I think the mine does. The the kind oh. I bought has salt. When I had to watch my salt, I knew that. Okay. But it says this, right? It's uh, all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of God. So it, you know, it's a response. Then I think uh, as a a praise psalm in response to what's happening in the X story. Therefore, it might be you can use it liturgically. Exactly, which is actually. Psalm always is as, as a response to the first reading. There but you go. yes, you could you could include it in other parts, the prayers, you know, and so on. Yes. And uh, then we come to uh, John 5 or 1 John 5, this section of 1 John 5. Uh, any, um, any words that we might want to say about this? Maybe this is one of the times where you where you skip verses. Or delete verses. <laughs> well, why would you say that? Like, verse six is so has such an interesting textual history and is so oh yeah mysterious. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't read it, but that's and that's probably not where a sermon should go. But uh, you will know right away if somebody brought their pocket King James version is reading along <laughs> and see okay, how so, different that looks. So, so uh, explain. Oh, I, my King James Version is way back on a shelf, but I believe, here it is, my NRSV footnotes. Uh, this is actually verse 7. Oh, I'm sorry, the lectionary does skip it. There are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Oh, yeah. But in the King James, it's, there are three that testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these yeah. three are one. Oh, I get <laughs> so, it, yeah. That is when interesting. The, when the RSV came out, people thought the RSV translators weren't Christian because they said, "We're not going to, we're not going to use that reading because it's, you know, we have better Greek text." But the point still remains that what's go, whatever's going on with the way that water, spirit, whatever testify is a little bit um, yeah. peculiar here. So anyway, Jesus Christ with the water and the blood. Thanks. I, I did assume this has these are connections to life. These are connections to childbirth. These are connections, uh, perhaps for some to uh, to sacraments. Although I think a fight might break out between you two if I say this is a direct reference to baptism in the in the Lord's Supper. Well, it's a, it, it's also a connection to the crucifixion in John. Yeah, the, exactly. That's the, the, la the last. Yeah, yeah John nineteen thirty eight to forty two. Yeah. Maybe this isn't where we want to go, but just to say this is a passage that has summarizing a lot of Johannine stuff in a, in a very short space. I appreciate it. I, I didn't know that about 1 John uh, 5, 7, so I always learn things from you guys. But it, you know, it, I, I do think that the, the earlier part of the passage is compelling, um, that everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child, and we know that we love the children of God. I mean, just continuing that, um, the familial language of uh, First John, the kinship language, and uh, and again hammering away at the theme of love. 